My name is um, Cheryl Phillips, and we're going to go ahead and get started with the afternoon session. I'm really excited to be here with a great group of, of journalists and, and journalists who uh, know all about using data for accountability uh, journalism, kind of public service journalism. I'm uh, a, a professor, a lecturer here at Stanford teaching data journalism, and I've done data journalism for a very long time. I actually wrote in a bio recently that I've been involved in data journalism since the Trash 80 was a mobile device. So um, if any of you remember back that far. Uh, I've, and, and if you do data journalism, at some point in time, you'll end up uh, touching some kind of vehicle or transportation related data. Just in general, almost everybody I know, probably at least once in their career, might have, might have done that. So I used to work for the Detroit News in the 1990s, and we actually, there was a traffic helicopter doing reports of traffic conditions on the freeways, and they reported a pothole from the air because the roads were in such bad condition. Uh, Paul might uh, relate to this. And so I actually did a project where we looked at road condition data and um, why were the roads in such poor condition in Michigan. And it turned out that one of the reasons was because the matching money from the federal government uh, funded new roads much more than it did uh, repair and maintenance of old roads. And Michigan has some of the oldest roads in the country when it comes to highways and freeways. So there was a, a project on that. And then when I worked at the Seattle Times, most recently in the 2000s, I did a project taking a look at racial profiling by the state patrol, basically showing the, the kind of continual disparities in search stops and searches related to minorities, and particularly with searches, uh, even though uh, contraband, is, contraband is found far less uh, when you, with minorities than it is with whites. So I, I have my own history with, with using um, transportation-related data, as do all, all of the members of this panel. And uh, we're going to we have a big panel, so we're going to quickly go through uh, each one of them making a, a brief presentation and then kind of uh, start uh, lobbying some questions at them. So I'll just do very brief introductions. Um, Mo Tammen is from Reuters, and he's a data editor there and done all kinds of data-related journalism investigations. And he'll, he'll be talking a little bit about this, the state of the, the field in terms of being able to, you know, what do journalists want to access and, and what, uh, what is in the public good. Uh, Michael Morrissey is the co-founder of a site called Muckrock. Uh, which is uh, an investigative news site uh, that mines public records. And he's been involved with uh, the Boston Globe and um, the Bo uh, some investigations in Boston about uh, license plate scanning programs and the amount of data that they collect and how it's used and problems with those programs. Danielle Ivory's here with us from the New York Times. And she's been working on National Highway Traffic Safety Administration data, taking a look in the last year specifically on recalls and the role of regulators with those recalls. Robert Benincasa is here from the NPR, NPR and uh, he has a long history of using uh, car and vehicle data and transportation data for a variety of safety-related stories, as well as uh, tracking um, kind of police behavior. And John Maines is here from the Florida Sun Sentinel, which won a Pulitzer Prize uh, for its investigation into um, off-duty uh, police speeding using electronic toll data. And then uh, Paul Ingracia is back on this panel as well, the managing editor of Reuters, to talk a little bit about uh, data journalism and uh, traffic and, and vehicle-related data and public accountability journalism. So we'll go ahead and, and let folks get started. Uh, I guess I'm up first. Uh, Mo Tamman uh, from Reuters. Um, I just want, to, it's an interesting crowd here to me because it seems that there are a collection of journalists who have one set of interests in data and you have uh, engineers and entrepreneurs who have entirely different set of interests in data. And, and I thought it might be useful to perhaps uh, explain, um, at least uh, when you're working on uh, investigative pieces and, and, and longer form journalism, where you come from. Uh, and mostly uh, I hear the voice of a, an old editor of mine to this day, um, who used to tell me that good news rarely is. And, and what he meant by that was that um, if things are happening the way they're supposed to happen, no one cares about it, nor should they. Um, the expectation <laughs> that humans and the institutions we create and the products we buy and use should operate the way they claim they're going to operate. 
Um, it's only when those things and places and pieces and people do things that um, are somehow different or wrong or aberrant that it becomes news. Um, you know, and, and that may, uh, for some people, feel uh, that we're being really, you know, not very fair to our society, but the truth is that is what we expect as people and it's what we expect as an industry and it's what we expect as journalists. So we come to this um, from the point of view that I'm, I'm going to tell a story only if there's something to be told that's wrong. And, and I wonder, as I sit here and listen to some of the developers and, and, uh, and, and engineers and such, um, offering up what their products are, if they, that, they don't, that there is a disconnect. But what we are going to be interested in your product, Waze, for example, if, if that was... Um, if that was a partnership perhaps between a, a local government and, uh, and, and, uh, and the company uh, and something went wrong, we want access to that data to illustrate what went wrong. Um, I'm going to be less interested if your system does really well in helping to solve problems of traffic jams, but I'm really interested if your system causes traffic jams. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and the other aspect I want to make uh, clear about this is that we work in a particular specialty of journalism, most of us here anyway. Um, you know, some people call it data journalism, some people call it forensic journalism, some people call it computer-assisted reporting. There are all kinds of names for it, but basically what it is is that you take structured data generally, or you take <coughs> unstructured data and apply some structure to it um, through whatever techniques are available. Um, and you want to say something. You want to be able to say something very specific, and usually you want to say something very bad. And that might give you a, a transportation example that we re recently came across. Um, and, and by the way, before I do that, I should also point out that we are not necessarily going to be telling the story in a balanced way. We have a finding to tell you. Yes, you will have a chance to defend yourself, who is, is the subject of this, and you can certainly poke holes in the story as much as you wish, but the fact of the matter is we have a finding, we have found it using our own analysis, and we are going to tell and pr prosecute that story as aggressively as possible. But you also have an obligation to fairness, and you have an obligation to be right. And what I tell my reporters, and I run a team that's uh, uh, both here and in London, uh, excuse me, in New York and in London, is that you make your arguments <coughs> um, from the position most favorable to the defense. So even though you're taking a prosecutor, almost a prosecut prosecutorial position, in so much you're making an argument about a story, you're making an argument about a position, you are always taking the position as most favorable to the defense. Uh, and I hope that that makes sense. So, for example, um, the GM uh, switch issue uh, that was all in the news uh, just recently. Um, the the uh, FARS data that was discussed earlier on today um, helped us to look at the possibility that there were additional deaths as a result of that. At the time, I think uh, GM was talking about 13. Um, and basically what we did was, and I think this is an important element of understanding data in general, and how the structure of that data is put together, and what the little codes mean, and why they can be, have subtle meanings one way or another. You have to become an expert on how that data is collected, who collects it, why they collect it, why they chose to put it in there in the first place, why it's a legacy thing that no longer matters, but you've got to pay attention to it. All these factors have to be considered. And when you looked at that data, for example, um, do you take, for example, uh, you include fatal accidents where there was um, uh, a front-end collision at 2 o'clock relative to the front? Well, there are some people who would argue that that would not necessarily cause a, um, a front airbag to deploy, so maybe you don't do that. Okay, so you narrow your scope. Now you're looking at 11 and 1 o'clock on the accident. What about the possibility that the passenger um, in the car was less than a certain weight or a certain height? Is it possible that in those circumstances that the airbag wouldn't deploy? Well, that's possible too, so let's narrow it down. Um, what about speed? There are any number of factors that go into making those decisions. And I have um, dealt with some reporters who work at Reuters who get very excited. They've gone and done their own analysis. But unfortunately, you have to be so careful about understanding the fundamentals of how that database is put together that you can easily make mistakes. 
And again, you're going to make an argument that something has happened without understanding that a two o'clock collision, for example, may still result in a non-deployment of uh, an airbag, and that would be unrelated to whether or not the switch wasn't working. All right? And I think that type of understanding is essential to being able to prosecute a story accurately and fairly and to tell the story from the position most favorable to the defense. So with that, on that note, I'll All pass right. it back over. Okay. Good. And we'll move to uh, Michael Morrissey from Muckrock. Go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Morrissey. Uh, I'm the founder of a website, muckrock.com. Only once, not three times as it is on display. Um, and what we do is we're probably the easiest way to file and track a public records request. Uh, we've filed about 14,000 public records requests on all sorts of issues. Um, and we just have a nice little form. People come. Sometimes we file it from our staff side. Um, sometimes random people on the internet use our site to file and track public records requests. Um, and then sometimes we write stories if there's interesting results. Um, and then sometimes those stories really annoy the government and they tell us that they're going to arrest us for publishing the information they gave us. Um, and then this might be one of the stories that angered the government, uh, a not government agency the most um, when we took a look at uh, license plate scanning technology deployed in the city of Boston. Um, so it, who's familiar with license plate scanners, ALPR? Okay, so they're, they're getting increasingly used um, and not a whole lot of discussion about when, where, and how. Um, but we did a big piece, uh, kind of sort of, one of our users said, hey, I want to know how is license plate scanners being used in my city. Um, and there's two main types. There's some that are kind of almost like red light cameras that just sort of every time somebody drives by, they capture the license plate, and then they say, hey, is this in a database of known scoff laws? No, discard the data, yes, send out an alert. Um, and then the newer type is uh, sort of these mounted mobile units where as a, you know, a police cruiser or any other vehicle set up with this drives by, um, it sort of does like a Google Street View, step instead of high-res imagery, it just grabs as many license plates in the area as it can. Sometimes it keeps all this data, sometimes it just looks for certain hits against a database, Sometimes it transmits it back to a third party that kind of says, hey, if something happens in 30 days, you can retroactively recreate the scene of a crime. Um, and so we filed requests for this data and the contracts for sort of what was being bought. Um, and they gave us a lot of really nice data. Uh, so this is just a little snippet of what they gave us. Um, you can see sort of the date and time, which camera was used, latitude, longitude. Uh, they also gave us the actual license plate numbers um, so that we could go back and do stuff like this uh, and sort of see exactly where things were happening, what time they were being taken. So this is just one small block of what was being covered. Um, and actually, if you can read it, if you have better eyes than me, this is actually just right around the police station. Um, and this was sort of what we totally saw uh, throughout the Boston area. Now this was, um, all this data is at that uh, URL down there. Um, so what we did is we got these two databases. There's blue database, uh, which has more fine-grained detail, and then the green database, which was sort of a different system that had a little less data. Um, and what we did, it ended up doing was sort of redacting all the license plate numbers because we were pretty sure they didn't mean to give them to us. Um, because with this information, uh, you could pretty accurately sort of see, hey, where is this person hanging out at night? This is one where, this was actually a police cruiser that was accidentally put on the scoff law list. What we found was that a lot of times they were tracking themselves accidentally. <laughs> um, and so we took that, we figured, okay, that's okay. if, if we published this information. Um, we didn't tie it to the individual. We just kind of looked at sort of this is over a couple, course of a couple months, how often they scan this one car. Um, and what we found was that there was a lot of scans. This was about over a six month period. Uh, they took 68,000 scans, 45,000 cars. So usually they got you one in 1.2 times uh, if they got you, which isn't, you can't have that fine-grained uh, sort of look at somebody's lifestyle, 
But one of the problems was they were only supposed to keep this data for about 30 days, and they were keeping it for six months, and they said they didn't know how to delete it, uh, which was sort of a violation of their own policy. Um, not only did they not know how to delete it, but none of it was properly secured, and most of it was improperly kept. Um, and I think one really good example is sort of giving private information to a reporter when they ask for it. Um, <laughs> but it made a really good story for us. Um, so we started, and this actually started as a statewide look. Um, most of this equipment was sort of given to local agencies uh, as part of a federal grant. And this is time and time again with the license plate scanning material, but also a lot of other things. Uh, we see federal grant money um, is kind of like Christmas for a lot of agencies. They don't have to go to their local legislatures. They don't have to go to the town council. They sort of say, hey, FBI, hey, Homeland Security, uh, this is what we'd like. They give it to them. There's usually very little oversight. Uh, what we found was that a lot of these agencies were getting hundreds of thousands of dollars from the federal government, getting the equipment, realizing they didn't know how to use it, and just keeping it, but never actually <coughs> deploying it, um, which is maybe better than deploying it and then accidentally giving all that private information to a reporter, but still probably not super productive. Um, and so what we found uh, when we looked more broadly than Boston. Now, Boston was actually one of the better cities because they did have a policy. They said, you can only keep this information if there's sort of probable cause. You can only keep it for 30 days even if you have that probable cause. They just didn't follow that policy. Um, so maybe that was a little bit better than two-thirds of the uh, cities that we looked in in Massachusetts had this equipment, but no policy whatsoever. So they could just keep this data. Um, most of them did not have any sort of security procedures around how it was handled. Um, most of them sort of had these shady partnerships with third-party companies that could then go ahead and resell all the data that the police were sucking up. Um, so kind of going through this massive, massive uh, database, we found a few uh, key takeaways. Uh, first of all, not surprisingly, uh, poor neighborhoods disproportionately targeted. That's pretty much true of any sort of creepy surveillance program out there. Um, most agencies fundamentally did not understand the technology. This was a little more surprising, and it, it always surprises me how often that these agencies will get really expensive technology and not invest any money in training on how to use it, not invest any time in sort of figuring out what are the dangers, what are the use cases. They just want a pretty dashboard, and they want sort of cool new toys. Um, and we saw that again and again where talking with the agencies, looking at their procedures, it was very clear they did not understand the technology they were deploying. Um, most agencies just did not seem to understand the implications of the data. Uh, Boston Police, um, we spent seven months going back and forth with them about getting the release of some of the data. Uh, and they had seven months to think about what should and should not we release. Uh, and then they just released it all anyway. Um, and we saw this again and again where sort of agencies don't have a chief privacy offer. They don't have a data specialist. Um, and so. It, this is very tricky stuff, as anybody who's ever sort of poked a little toe into the world of big data, uh, especially when it comes to sort of mass data collected on millions of individuals. It's very easy to do something wrong, even if you think you're anonymizing the data. And just like that wasn't even the level of the conversation. Um, most agencies do not have a plan for properly securing the data. Uh, we found stuff stored on Dropbox. We found stuff stored uh, on all sorts of unsecured networks. Um, we saw a lot of agencies that didn't have sort of a password on their Wi-Fi, and you could just log in and cause lots of problems. Um, and then most problem, uh, the vast majority of these kinds of programs were the results of grants, uh, generally federally funded pilot programs. Um, but then kind of digging into all this, one of the recurring themes was that there was all this data that was being sucked up. There was all this sort of information. The agencies were super happy, and they were sort of really defensive about being able to use this data. They kept saying, this is going to save lives. What about when a little girl is kidnapped? Uh, do you want her blood on your hands? Um, but then you kind of start poking around at the data, and it's all super, super uh, untrustworthy. Um, one of the big problems is that uh, you're sort of mashing up apples and oranges when you're dealing with a lot of these data sets. Uh, they go through a big hodgepodge of different vendors, and so sometimes it's in one format, sometimes it is in another format, and uh, if you sort of try comparing it, uh, it becomes very quickly that 
either one or both of the data sets are so flawed as to be almost useless, um, but they still like having as much data as they can, no matter how accurate it actually is. Uh, one of the things that happened is actually after we started this reporting and realizing how broad this kind of surveillance was, uh, one of uh, my reporters got pulled over driving home and the officer said, hey, uh, you know, this car is stolen, you, you know, and, and gave him a really hard time, as you can imagine. But it turns out it was a case of, I live in Boston, which has a little bit of that these days, uh, snow, um, where snow very often or any sort of other dirt obscures the license plate and gives a false reading. And so we saw that time and time again, uh, there was a lot of data that was really bad. Um, and then the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, saw what we did, filed a similar request in Oakland, got back a bunch of really information, really interesting information, and they saw uh, dozens and dozens of false positives where a sign like one way would show up in the database as a license plate one way. Um, which is probably not the greatest way to go about it. Um, but they found very similar results and problems in sort of Oakland's uh, raw ALPR data. Um, and so after all this reporting, uh, the state legislature in Massachusetts at least considered passing some prohibitions on the use and retention of this data. It didn't go anywhere because Massachusetts. Um, but the Boston police did eventually cancel their program after saying we have no idea how to actually do this properly, uh, which seemed like a really good thing um, until we realized that it really doesn't matter because uh, Boston police did tens of thousands of scans over six months. Um, there's a bunch of uh, two major uh, private companies that are doing 70 million scans per month, and because they're private companies, uh, there's actually uh, currently zero legislation that can actually stop them from collecting this data and reselling it. And the police were actually really excited when they realized that instead of having to deploy this kind of technology on their cruisers, uh, they could pay some private company a certain amount of money per month, um, get all this data, not be subject to pesky public records laws and having to deal with reporters like me, um, and getting a much, much more complete look at uh, where everybody was driving. Um, and what we found was that private repo companies um, were all sticking this kind of technology on the top of their car and actually going out and getting electric cars, just driving around and then reselling this information. Um, one of the things we found is that A, uh, about on average, every license plate in America has been scanned three times uh, by these private companies. Uh, this was a year ago, so it's probably like six times now or something like that. Um, and then B, these private companies then turn around. One company we found uh, was selling, they'll run a license plate you give them for $20 and show you everywhere that they've tracked it. Um, and all you had to do was say that you were a private investigator, but they didn't actually check to make sure you were a private investigator, uh, which raises a lot of concerns. So uh, happy to answer any of the questions later in the Q&A. But um, Muckrock, if you look up ALPR, most of our stuff will uh, come up. Thank you. Um, I guess that's me. I'm Danielle Ivory. I'm a reporter with the New York Times. I'm going to try and make this really short because I'd really like for all of you to be able to ask questions. Um, about a year ago, in fact, a year ago this week, General Motors announced um, the first of a very uh, notable uh, recall of defective ignition switches in Chevrolet Cobalt, Saturn Ions, and a bunch of other cars. Uh, they eventually expanded that recall and connected uh, the defect to 13 deaths. Now it's been connected to uh, at least 52 deaths. Um, we thought that that was really interesting. One of the things that happened while this was all breaking is that GM reported to regulators that they had known about problems uh, with these cars for more than a decade. So if you've been living in a cave, um, the ignition switch defect causes the ignition to shut off and then um, that can cut power to the engine and also disable airbags and could be very dangerous if you happen to be driving. Um, 
a small group of us at the time started looking into this and really uh, right away were interested in the role of regulators, particularly at the federal level. We looked at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which uh, everyone here has been referring to as NHTSA. And we were interested in NHTSA for two main reasons. Uh, one, we really wanted to know what the regulators had known and, and when, and if they had known early, why didn't they do something sooner? And then we were also um, just very interested in what sort of data NHTSA collects, what sort of documents, and how, how they um, handle recalls, uh, just as a general uh, principle. So right away, we started looking at NHTSA's data. And what we found, I think, over the course of the year is that it's actually, it was some of the most helpful data that we were able to get our hands on. Um, NHTSA collects complaints from drivers. They collect in, in one place uh, data on all fatalities um, on the road, and those are mainly from police reports. Um, they collect something called early warning data, which is now required uh, under the Tread Act of 2000, which was spurred by Ford Firestone. And that data, actually my colleague Aaron Kessler, I don't know if he's still here, was referring to it earlier as being pretty, pretty sparse, and it is. Um, but it's still, it's still useful data. Um, because it can be paired with all of these other databases. Um, NHTSA puts out all of its information on investigation dockets. They put out information on recalls. They uh, share little bits of technical service bulletins that automakers send car dealers to alert them of issues. They're not really supposed to be safety issues, but they get buried in there. Um, there's some data uh, for foreign recalls. It's, it's a really interesting thing where NHTSA collects and produces this incredible amount of data, but then it's messy. Some of it is very unwieldy. And then you have databases. We have two or three or four or five databases when you could just have one that would really tell you a lot more about the world. So what we went about doing is taking those databases and just stitching them together ourselves. And right away, we found that NHTSA had gotten hundreds of complaints about ignition problems in the cars that had been recalled for years before, as soon as the cars hit the market, in fact. Um, and as GM expanded its recall and then actually issued many more recalls throughout the year, um, at least 16.5 million just related to ignition issues, most of which res result in unexpected stalling, we could see that NHTSA had gotten thousands of complaints about those sort of issues in those cars, but it's unclear to us what, what that data was doing other than sitting there in a database. <laughs> um, so, uh, what I would say is that um, after spending a whole year looking at this data, uh, it's actually really great, but there are so many more things that you could do with it if it was uh, collected in a way so that journalists and academics, researchers, law enforcement, um, you know, all the people who are really interested in auto safety could put all the pieces together. Um, for instance, we worked a lot with the FARS data as well. That's every fatality on the road. And what we wanted to find out was the identity of the 13 <coughs> victims that GM had tied to the ignition switch defect. So <laughs> we went to EWR, which is um, where automakers have to report to regulators any, uh, any accident that resulted in a fatality or an injury that um, uh, was blamed on a defect, on a potential defect. We took that data, which is very sparse, and we matched up uh, the state of the accident and um, the partial VIN number and uh, some other factors 
with the FARS database. And from there, we could get the gender of the person in the accident and uh, the actual county that it occurred in. And then we were going to newspaper clippings and looking for local reports about those accidents. And there were just a lot of extra steps in there. And what would be great is if, uh, as a reporter, would be if you had one database that synced up that information with all the complaints about that car, with any foreign recalls that involved that car in the States, but there was no recall. Um, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, um, who's next? Robert. Right. Hi, I'm Robert Benincasa. I'm a data journalist at NPR in Washington, D.C. I've been doing data analysis for journalism since the early 90s. Watched the, the field change uh, over the years. <clears throat> in the earlier years, I watched it change as the personal computer developed. And uh, more lately, I'm, I'm watching the field change as big data and the ubiquity of data start to become part of our, all of our lives. Um, I also teach journalism, and one of the things that I start out telling my students is I try to tell them what data, what, what's a database, right? And, and, and a lot of people in journalism, especially those who are starting out, don't necessarily know that they can use data as evidence for their stories to, to, to uh, do some of the things that my colleagues here have been talking about. So I start talking about events. And I say events become data, data points, right? Someone complains about something. There's an accident. There's a fatality. Someone inspects something. Someone charges someone with a crime. Someone registers something, sells something. All of these interactions that occur in daily life, many of them generate data. And so as in journalism, when we start thinking about that, we start thinking about, OK, here's this universe of events. How does that relate to what I have to do to cover the world as a journalist, to talk about things like um, our culture, fairness, uh, things that are, are inequities in, our, in society, the economy, et cetera, right? So with that, starting out with that paradigm, I'll tell you a story I did, a um, <clears throat> couple of examples. Um, I was a reporter in Vermont in the 90s, um, and I asked the state police for all of their records of all of the tickets they wrote for, for a year. And um, I um, analyzed the data, and I, I figured that this is interesting. A lot of people saying, you know, there's a lot of anecdote going around, right? And when we do data stories, we try to take anecdote and compare it to something that's more like akin to evidence, more like data, right? And I found uh, gender differences in the way cops write tickets. Male cops were writing a majority of their tickets to male drivers. Female cops were about half and half, right? So part of the story was an interview with the state trooper who had the highest proportion of male defendants, okay, if you will. He wrote 93% of his tickets to males. And I asked him why. And he said, because women drivers remind him of his mother. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> and he also had some other reasons, but you can imagine which one was in the paper. Okay. Um, so, other things, I and other reporters have taken traffic data. We've mapped out the speed traps, you know, back before we even had websites. We were putting in maps of speed traps in the newspaper, right? We're putting them in there because we got this data and we did that. Um, <clears throat> another thing, I also use the FARS data, Fatality Analysis Reporting System, um, to look at the fact that teenage boys, right, and, you know, I was one of them. I, I made the, dr the drag racing uh, comment a little while ago. Um, 
Teenage boys are dying in cars um, at a pretty consistent rate, even as other people are not dying in cars quite as much. Their rate of death is uh, not dropping. They're twice as likely as teenage girls to die in a car. They're twice as likely as teenage girls to be drinking when they die in a car. So that was an opportunity, you know, just doing a, a pretty superficial data, national data analysis, but that fact was there. It was an opportunity to do a story, did a story uh, for NPR. Another thing in the, in the fatality analysis uh, data was, um, was about motorcyclists and the fact that um, motorcyclists, uh, half the time when they die on their, on their bike, they're by themselves. And there's a culture among motorcyclists to blame drivers. Well, we wanted to debunk that a little bit. And we also did some more, we used uh, helmet laws as a kind of environmental variable, and we found that as helmet laws got more relaxed, the deaths went up. Um, another NHTSA complaint data uh, that Danielle was talking about. I asked NHTSA, I said, give me the, the database of complaints that relate to unintended acceleration. And this was when Toyota was in the news for, their, for runaway cars, right? And a lot of my colleagues at other news organizations were saying, X number of people have, have died in Toyotas. And I'm thinking, is that a lot? I mean, is it 10, is it 15, is that a lot? Toyota sells a lot of cars, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking, I need a denominator, right? So what I did was, um, took those NHTSA complaints that are unintended acceleration, went to Ward's Auto Automotive Group, and obtained their sales figures by make and model by year going back 10 years. We did, the, we did an analysis. We found out that unintended acceleration has been a problem, not just Toyotas, but that varying by year and model, sometimes they were a big problem with Volkswagen, sometimes they were a, a big problem with General Motors, and based on, at least based on the complaints. And we stopped the analysis at the point where this became in the media because w w what happened was as soon as this stuff was out in the media people started complaining a lot more about unintended acceleration okay for whatever reason um, another story that we did that was that was data driven that related to vehicles some of the some of the fines that people were paying uh, had to pay to 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 benton county washington this one town that we looked at related to vehicles, people who couldn't pay their fines were going to jail. And this was part of the basis for a story that we called Guilty in Charge. And it was about how if you owe money to the government uh, in, in this community and others, they put you in jail. It's a debtor's prison. Um, there's a um, screenshot, uh, screenshot of the two stories that I mentioned. Um, there's a typical USA Today map that was part of my, uh, part of my series uh, about uh, motorcycle deaths. Um, there's the, uh, the fever line on the helmet laws and the, um, the motorcycle deaths. Our story, um, oh, almost into someone else's presentation. I, I'm gonna pretty much stop there uh, with a few screenshots, but uh, be happy to entertain your questions after. Go ahead, John. All right. My name is John Maines. I'm the database editor at the Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale. Um, you might see on the program that I'm also the computer assisted reporting specialist. And the truth is that uh, when I was given the job I got, uh, there was no job title for me. So technically, my job title is the same as the fashion editor. Uh, so, uh, but it, basically, my presentation is uh, on a project we did on off-duty cops who were speeding. And uh, what it, it was well known in South Florida, where we're from Miami, uh, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, that cops sped. Anybody who drove, uh, I had happened to me several times, you'd be driving down the highway at 70 miles an hour at 9 o'clock at night, and something would go back by you very fast at probably 120 miles an hour, you would think. And it turns out that we found out it likely was. Uh, and it would be a cop with no lights or sirens just going home. And so basically we did this project and we're going to start this video which is a good summary, it's a two minute video. Deputies to come rushing during emergencies. 
But what about when there's no emergency? South Florida law enforcement officers are sworn to uphold traffic laws on our roadways, but they're among the worst speeding offenders a Sun Sentinel investigation has found. Oftentimes, the speeding ends with fatal results. This was a tragic accident. I know what I did was wrong. I know I was driving faster than the speed limit on that night. The Sun Sentinel has learned that more than 700 cops from a dozen agencies hit speeds of 90 to 130 miles an hour through South Florida highways from October of 2010 through November of 2011. <coughs> Miami police officers were among the most chronic off-duty speeders with 143 cops driving at least 90 miles an hour, all of them outside city limits. More than 50 exceeded 100 miles an hour. When shown the records, even Miami police officials seemed surprised by the numbers the Sun Sentinel uncovered. Can I get a copy of this? Because this yeah, is we, we, we're, we're going to leave this Beautiful, with you. beautiful. Thank you. Wait, all those rounds? Yeah. Wow. That's not very prudent to be out <laughs> violating the very laws that we, we enforce. This is something for uh, our, our internal affairs major to receive and, and investigate because, you know, again, the policy is what the policy is, and the policy says that they will. Uh, they will adhere to the laws, rules, and regulations, and the departmental orders. And, and um, you know, anytime we find that someone's not doing that, then they'll have to deal with the consequences that come with that. The problem with speeding cops caught national attention in October when a state trooper clocked Miami police officer Fausto Lopez going 120 miles an hour on Florida's turnpike on his way to a second job. <laughs> Okay, so what we used to do this, well, we, we knew, since we knew this, we decided uh, this made the news. Somebody got a hold of, uh, a Hispanic television station got a hold of that video, and there's more to it than that. But uh, we decided to actually document this, and the way, what we did was we used a couple of things. We used the electronic toll data that uh, cops use in, in uh, South Florida. We have the uh, transponder that goes on your windshield, and as you go under a gantry, it reads it just like you have out here in the, in the east. So we got that from the state, and I won't go into that. There was some difficulty in doing that. Uh, maybe in the Q&A we do, could go into that. But we got that eventually from them. And we also, uh, that data did not have distance measurements from toll booth to toll booth. So we had to do that on our own. And we did that actually using a little Garmin device that uh, uh, marathon runners use to track their distance. And it was very accurate. But ultimately, we did a three-part series. Uh, the first story, and this will give you an idea how newspaper people think. Uh, first is the story, the overview. Cops, no limit, no speed limit. Uh, we always think when we're doing a story, well, are there victims here or not? Yes, there are victims. Ruined lives, uh, not only cops sometimes kill themselves, but more often than not, they kill or maim somebody else. Uh, young Kara Caitlin in the lower left there was in that car up there. Uh, she, there was a 40 mile an hour speed limit. The driver of the car misjudged how far the cop car coming at her with no lights or sirens was going, and it was 87 miles an hour. And she turned in front of it to make a left turn. Uh, Karen never stood a chance. And then finally, you ask the cops, uh, why do you do this? Because we can. And they said, we got this from a lot of cops uh, who would talk to us and say, you know, they, they have a whole code where it's called badging out, where if you get pulled over and you're speeding and you're a cop, you show it to the other cop and you're allowed to go. This is what didn't work in our calculations. Um, basically, uh, we'll basically, public records for GPS data, the cops wouldn't give it to us. That would tell us where they live and it put them in danger, even though it says Miami-Dade Police, right in big letters on the side of the car that they park in the driveway. Black box data was no good uh, because you'd have to tear apart the car. And we bought a radar gun, which was hopelessly <laughs> stupid. <laughs> um, this is a sample of SunPass data. Uh, basically, there is no analysis of the uh, start and stop point. We had to do that ourselves. This is what you see on your bill, basically. Uh, we, this, is our speed we, we, this is our calculations of the mileage from point to point. We actually use Google Maps sometimes on a non-popular route. Uh, but basically, uh, we, Google Maps turned out to be, be pretty good, but usually we're using the Garmin. Um, and of course, worries. Whenever you're doing something like that, basically, as an investigative reporter, uh, usually when we start out doing something, we have no clue what the hell we're doing. You know, I had no, no idea how toll booths used. 
worked and all this stuff. Uh, the accuracy of the clocks, the measuring devices, were the clocks in sync, was one clock five minutes behind the other on the, on the toll. The accuracy of the GPS, we worked that out. Uh, were the cops responding to an emergency? That would be fair. But remember, these cops were going back and forth to work. So a, every day they left at the same time, they went home at the same time. So you could tell that they were commuting. Um, the clocks in sync, we got lucky on that. There were actually two different uh, data systems, and they were all in sync with the atomic clock system in Washington. Uh, this is, if you look on the far right, this is our final product that I did after analysis. This is average speeds. You see 129.8 on the, remember average, you have to go around the loop on the interstate when you're getting on the intersection. Uh, that's just a sample of that in the cop department on the left, transfer to ponder is number, date, time, et cetera. Here is our poster boy for speeds. This is Fausto Lopez. This is the car that uh, got, the guy that got pulled over. If you see the speed limit there is 65 miles an hour. What I did was I took his speeds for every single day. First I was gonna do it for every week or every month. How fast was he going that month? I said, well, why, why not every single route that he goes? So that's all his routes. You can see up there 105, 120 miles an hour. Far on the right there, when he got pulled over, you can see the first red dot, that's where he slowed down. He slowed down a little bit. But the big thing that slowed him down was the day that this appeared on television, his, that, the video you just saw, and you'll see that on the second red dot. <laughs> Results. Um, by December 2012, uh, this was, we did this story, in, uh, the story ran in February 2012, in December we did it again. 84% reduction in excessive, excessive speeding by the cops, 180 officers disciplined. One city did decide to install, install GPS, uh, another said I activated, a, had a device that activated when the cops feeds, and finally uh, young Fausto Lopez lost his job. And that's it for me. Huh? Um, well, I'm a, I was a last minute addition to this panel for a very simple reason. When I saw that this panel was going to uh, discuss or present the uh, uh, John Sun Sentinel series, which was terrific, I realized uh, immediately that two years ago when this uh, won the Pul Pulitzer Prize for Public Service and Journalism, which is really the, the Public Service Award is really the highest honor for those of you who are not non-journalists, I, I just happened to be uh, the chairman of the Public Service Jury of the Pulitzers that year. Uh, and I just wanted to say a couple things about what really impressed uh, the, the panel. Uh, first of all, when I, I, have to, I have to confess that when I got this list of entries and saw speeding cops in South Florida, it was, so what, right? Um, you don't need an app or a website or calculations to know that cops speed all the time. We've all been passed on the roads. But what really made the difference was the deep, rich data they had about just the pervasiveness of speeding, but also uh, the killing and the maiming of, of innocent uh, uh, people as a result of this. It was just time after time, it was um, uh, just laid out in a thorough, systematic, uh, and very complete way. And the other thing that was very impressive about this series of articles was uh, the tone. There was not a lot of, um, you know, uh, rhetorical heavy breathing or, you know, big use of adjectives. It was really laid out in a very matter of fact. Here's what we found. We presented the, the, you know, the policemen who were doing this stuff in the police departments with the evidence, here's what they said. Uh, it was just totally devoid of sensationalism. And uh, it, was, it was so impressive that frankly, uh, this was actually, uh, our, our panel was, I think, either the first one uh, done out of about a dozen or 15 uh, Pulitzer uh, uh, juries. We were the first one done because it was an easy and unanimous choice. So congratulations, John. Thank you. Thanks. So we'll, we'll go ahead and, and kind of toss out a few questions, and then we can open it up to folks who, who would like to ask questions. I know one of the things that strikes me about this is that a lot of the data that we've discussed is public data. But I think, um, and one of the issues I think that comes up is, is the ease of access to data, especially when you're talking about things like Waze or, or um, you know, other data that's coming through public-private partnerships or through uh, development of, of new data sensors and cars and things like that. And that's a really difficult challenge. Even when it's public data, it's public uh, to a point. Uh, for example, there are 17 states that track uh, race in, in traffic stops for, by their state patrols. And yet, when I recently tried to request that public data from the state, 
their response to the data request was, well, that's an awful lot of pages to copy, and we think it'll cost a lot of money. And this was a data request. So it's, you know, there's a lot of negotiations that goes on. There's a lot of kind of laborious effort that goes to try to collect this data or stitch it together. So with that in mind, I kind of wanted to ask the panel, what do they think are the kind of the biggest threats to open, open government um, and related to the privatization uh, or even public-private <laughs> partnerships with, related to vehicle data? And kind of toss that out for, for thoughts from the panelists. Uh, I'll just uh, start since I was the last. Um, we, we run into that all the time, the, the, the partnership thing, where uh, a, a public agency hires a third party vendor and everybody here on this panel, I assure you, has run into that. And, they, and, they, and the public entity says, oh no, that's, uh, this company has it. We don't keep it anymore. We're, we can't tell you where the crimes are. And, they, and the company that has the data says, well, that's proprietary, ours. But that's against the law in Florida and probably in most states to do that. You can't hand it off to somebody else and say no. And that's happening a lot. And just on our project, the difficulty of getting the data, we, we, we have more trouble with bureaucrats and people than we have with the data. The data is easy if we get it. Um, the, the person who was in charge of the toll authority that we got this data from was brand new. She was ahead of it. Uh, we were already getting the data when she became in charge. And she said, we're shutting them down. They're not going to get any more public data from us to her staff. We heard this through a source. And, uh, and somebody was, uh, so, and, and she said this on a Friday. And she said, we're gonna meet on Monday, we're gonna, Monday we're, gonna, we're, we're gonna have a meeting with our general counsel, we're gonna come up with a reason why we're not gonna give them the data. And somebody on their staff said, but the taxpayers paid for this. Well, they suck too. You know, so, um, so, uh, so that problem of somebody being, a, having a little fiefdom, is, is tough for us. But as it happened, a good part of our story was the staff that was still there and had this ang mean boss, they went in on Saturday and got the data for us and sent it to us before that Monday meeting with the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> but there, but there, is a, there is a broader threat, I think, than just yeah. you know, uh, bureaucrats who, who perhaps don't understand who they really work for. I mean, we're seeing uh, routinely now uh, the privatization, privatization of criminal records, of uh, mm -hmm. prisons, of um, uh, court dockets, of, I mean, almost everything in, 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 in the public sector at some level is being privatized, and that means the data is being privatized, which means that the companies that owe them are trying to impose their own restrictions on the release of that data, even if it should be technically in the public sector. And so what you have is situation after situation where a request is made, the, pi the public entity will say, no, you cannot have it. And you say, why? And they say, because it's proprietary. And say, well, the information is not proprietary. Um, and the nature of the business being is there are very few news organizations out there that have the pockets deep enough to sue these um, government agencies to exert the right to those records, even if they have been moved into the private sector. Uh, I think there's a universal agreement that simply moving a product from a, a public entity to a private entity, if the information is intended to be public, should remain public. And it is a real fundamental threat to Americans' access to their government. Indeed, um, one particular specific example with the NHTSA is that they collect what are called technical service bulletins, um, and those are notices that automakers send to car dealers if there's some sort of problem. That's not supposed to be safety related, but some sort of upgrade um, or uh, a minor problem. Um, NHTSA collects this information and by law is supposed to make it public, but they only post a little bit of it online. And it's really pretty useless other than just providing a, a clue. Um, the way that we ended up getting around that and actually looking at the technical service bulletins was to go to a third party source called um, All Data, which collects this information and sells it by subscription to car dealers. And we had to subscribe to it. Um, and this is, it's public data, it's data that the agency has. They have the full technical service bulletins because we were able to get a couple of them from 
the government uh, directly. The other issue that we've run into quite a bit um, is the FOIA process itself uh, is being privatized. So for example, we've had an outstanding request for information with NHTSA for almost a year now, uh, and I was informed this week that that request, which is being processed by a contractor that they, they they won't tell me who the contractor is, um, is going to take at least a year or more to process. Um, so that, that just further muddies the water and makes the process itself less transparent. And let's face it, this has been perhaps the worst administration for open records since I got into the business. I mean, it is as you probably find every day opaque as any administration I've ever seen. I agree. So, with that said, I guess, I mean, that's pretty good. He's right next door. Kind of you know. <laughs> and that's from liberal Maybe journalists. <laughs> uh, I guess my, my, on the flip side of that, given all of the conversation we had in the panels earlier about all of this live data that's, that's being uh, tracked and, and, and used in some unique ways, what do you think are the upsides? What do you think are the possibilities? What's your great idea for how you could take some of that data and actually assuming that there would be access to it, which we hope, uh, how, could you, how could you use it for accountability journalism or for, for the public good in some way? I mean, my gosh, if we could have access to black box data after uh, a crash, if black box data was automatically transferred to police departments, that would be that would be a very big development because right now it's not automatically downloaded after a crash. Yeah, and I, I think there's a lot of even, uh, sort of, so many stories about the civic life are sort of anecdata, data, sort of like, hey, everybody's sort of piling up at this intersection, um, but you've seen so many sort of things where people, uh, reporters are able to use this kind of data to sort of say this is the most dangerous intersection in the city and then it gets fixed after being broken for decades. Uh, we've seen that a couple times in Boston as certain data sets have gotten more open, you see a lot of really good investigative reporting, but also investigative reporting that, that leads to change, which is fantastic. I was thinking about the, the pothole, and was it Waze that collects the pothole data? <laughs> Boy, you know, I've tried to collect uh, pothole data from a, a couple of different cities, and it's almost impossible to get. Um, and it's usually a static snapshot, but think about what you could do with that. That would be, that would be really fascinating from a perspective of of maintenance of streets, disparities related to where uh, things get repaired or where they don't. It yeah. would be very interesting if, if journalists had access to that data. And those things are very popular with readers of newspapers. You know, with, back when newspapers had much larger staffs, they'd have things like the pothole patrol, mm -hmm. where somebody would take a picture of a pothole, send it in, and the newspaper would call the city official and say, why is this a pothole? Well, people love that, believe it or not, just eat it right up. <laughs> uh, were you waiting to ask a question? Yeah. Go ahead and. <clears throat> so I think I had um, two, two areas I was interested in. I, I was curious about the license plate story. It was really interesting. And I wanted to understand, because the technology for doing opto, um, you know, recognition of, lic of license plates is just all over the place, and you can expect it to just get more prevalent, uh, what you've seen of the legislation and thinking about it, um, like we've already talked about um, once it goes to a private entity, it seems like it kind of disappears. Is there any legislation around if you're taking pictures at you know, large scale, you know, what, are, what are you restricted in doing? What can you release? Those, those sorts of things. And then the second area of questions maybe for the panel is um, I'm curious <clears throat> about uh, safety in autonomous cars and whether <laughs> you, know, you guys have thought about you know, how this is going to start generating stories or these sorts of things and, and the kinds of issues that you start running into there because I can imagine those will also tend to be private records except for the crash databases. Uh, yeah, so regarding the license plate scanners, uh, it's a good question. And there's been a few states that have tried to pass a legislation sort of banning the sort of private mass collection of, of license plate data. Um, but what they keep running into in those states is actually First Amendment protections, where the company says, this is no different than a reporter going out and snapping pictures of the cars. You can't <laughs> legalize that, so you can't do it if we do it times a gazillion. Um, and so as far as I know, no, none of that legislation has successfully stuck. 
Uh, I think it's a matter of time before they can figure out some way of sort of respecting the First Amendment while also saying maybe you shouldn't know where every private citizen drives 24 hours a day. Um, I do think there's probably a balance, but so far, uh, I think Utah might have passed a law um, that got struck down, but I, I could be wrong. Uh, but if you go to the second article, I'm happy to, it kind of goes through sort of how often these things have been struck down and how much money is going into this business. And it, the, the little data we have about the private repo companies is only because there's these two companies and they sued each other, and a lot of it came out during discovery. Otherwise, we won't even know the extent to what it is today. Yeah, kind of on that point, it just, just looking at the, the, what you were talking about, anybody can go out in the street and take a picture, right? And it's, it's protected by the First Amendment. You're in public. Anyone who's in public doesn't have an expectation of privacy, et cetera. And so you gather up all these license plate numbers. But unless you go into the motor vehicle database, all you have is license plate numbers. That's right. Which don't tell you who anyone is. That's right. Until someone says, I'm going to take that data and relate it to the, my, the, the motor vehicle databases. And it seems to me it's that second act that, is, that raises the privacy concerns, the due process concerns, the, uh, the ability to look at, at someone's activity without a warrant. It seems to me it's that second act that raises those questions. Uh, yeah, I don't think, I mean, I think to an extent, yes, but I think like when you're in your car, you probably have your phone with you. Then they start to know, they, it's, it's so easy to sort of take a couple different data points and figure out who that person is. And I'm, I used to write about the telecom industry and I'm sure they're trying to figure out, hey, can we figure out, you know, cross-link all this information you know, and, and if you know where somebody is at night and you know where they are during the day and at work, it's pretty easy to figure out who that person mm -hmm. is. And, I, you know, I do think sort of the, the license plate, and you've seen a lot of states get a lot more restricted about who they'll give out RMV or DMV information to. Yeah, um, it, you know, it strikes me a little bit like the, uh, the driver's license uh, data that used to be public um, and was used uh, kind of historically and to great effect to take a look at things like um, uh, felons of bad traffic records who were driving school buses, for example, um, things like that. And, and now driver's license data is almost uniformly private. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have old historical data sets of driver's license data that I've used uh, in journalism to, to track down people from time to time. But it's like you can't get that data any, any longer. And, um, and there were better. track used to have it. Auto track you used to get on auto track you could go ahead and get it and, and it, you could use it for really important journalistic purposes but there had that that tricky kind of privacy concern as well on how do you balance that and what happened was uh, that ended up leaving the public realm and I think for you know to some detriment as well as some benefit and so trying to figure that out with license plates and other things that are going to come up is going to be a very big issue I think so yeah questions over here go ahead but Hi, Robert Seidel, Modus Ventures. I have a, first of all, I want to thank you all for, in an age where media, most large media operations are not impeded by facts, you uh, still serve a very useful <laughs> purpose uh, by doing investigative journalism and looking at the facts. Um, I have a question that's kind of the opposite of the question that was asked over there. Um, when public agencies create their own data, they write tickets or they make permits and they put it on an open data server, that's one thing. It's clear that the public should have access to that because the public paid for it. Now, how about if, such as increasingly is the case, uh, public agencies buy data from private companies, uh, navigation data, tra traffic data, uh, uh, weather data, all kinds of, d does that then leak automatically leak into public domain as well, therefore kind of destroying the business case for the data gatherers? Do you have uh, knowledge or opinions about the, I hope I asked the question correctly. So if, 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 a, if a city government, for example, buys data from a, from a commercial provider, so therefore then the government has bought that data, does that data become immediately accessible to everybody like yourself? It depends on the rules and the, the, the laws in the state. Most, every state's going to have a different law as it relates to that. In, but, in Florida, but, but, the answer is yes. It does I, become public uh, domain, and I could get it, but they will still say no. Like we, we signed an agreement with the guy and said we're not going to give it out to you. Yeah, it's I mean, legal to do that. 
I'm sorry. It, it can work both ways. I mean, you could think about it in the way that taxpayers actually bought that data and it belongs to the taxpayers. Um, but I find that when I ask for data like that or similar sort of you know, contracting data, um, that often I'm told that it's proprietary and we really have to fight for it. And, and, and rarely you get, I remember one, and I don't know if this has changed, but for a long time, the federal contracting system used yeah, the, D, the DB, DMB number as the, the way to track the company. And so you could get the data of all the contracts that were issued by the federal government, but you couldn't get the I, unique identifier because they were using a DMB number which was proprietary and they wouldn't release mm -hmm. it. You can get so, it now. Yeah, you can get it now, but DMB actually had to agree to allow that, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. um, so, that, so you could track the companies back together. It's, it's a problem because um, effectively, in the case of the contracts, it shielded the public from knowing what was really going on. Um, and, I, and I'm really I'm very um, concerned any time I see the government relying on the, on the private sector for something that should have been in the public sector because they can impose, they can restrict your access to it. And then all of a sudden the public doesn't know. You know, yeah, they're saving money, but at, the, what, at what cost? And are they really saving money? And what are the consequences of using somebody else? And uh, there's so many possibilities of how the world, our world gets messed up, but we don't, we can't see it because now it's opaque. Yeah. And you know, by the way, for the record, there is a, a Jennifer LaFleur is back there. And Wave she's your hand, a, Jennifer. Stand up, Jennifer. <laughs> she's one of my. She's one, she, used, she used to be one of the people I would rely on on questions about uh, open record laws across the, the country um, for a long time when I was a reporter. Uh, uh, yeah, just because now they'll bother you. Go ahead. Uh, again, thanks for coming in. This is actually one of the one of the best conferences, and, and I've actually been to recently. Um, as an automotive journalist. Um, I'm kind of interested to know what you guys find to be the most used and most useful um, online databases, um, whether free or paid, the ones you're referencing the most over time to get some of this data. Um, and the second part of that question is any tips or tricks on kind of navigating the bureaucratic system <laughs> for a journalist? I, I, you guys have to have a few gems, I'm sure. So, You know, there, there are sessions that are like an hour long just about online databases. And then there are other sessions about the same length just on how to negotiate for data, <laughs> which Jennifer sometimes leads. So uh, you've got some good experts in the room about both of those, but I think it would probably tax the time we have left to go into great detail. I don't know if anybody wants to toss out a few few possibilities. But. I mean, in terms of NHTSA, there's the FARS database, there's EWR, there's recalls, investigations, and TSBs that you can cross-reference with all data's TSBs. Um, there are special crash investigations where NHTSA hires a contractor to drill deeply into a crash. There's the National Automotive Sampling System, which is sort of similar to that. Um, and there are foreign recalls, which are very interesting, um, a requirement that uh, came about because of the Tread Act. Um, those are foreign recalls it, that include cars that are, in the, that are basically the same in the United States that haven't been recalled um, for whatever, there, there are some actually very legitimate reasons why you would recall a car in say Korea but not in the US because maybe a, a part is locally sourced. Um, that database is, we, go ahead, I'm sorry, that database is great but everything's in PDF form so you have to manually go through and you know, click on each one. That's NHTSA in a nutshell. Anybody else really quickly have any thoughts? Yeah. Or? I was just going to say, as far as like negotiating with agencies or waiting through agencies for stuff that's not in an online database, uh, if you can find somebody who's previously gotten the data and kind of point them to that, that I found really expedites requests and really kind of increases the likelihood. Mm. So if, if, you know, if, if you see somebody else's investigation like from years ago, it's so rare that people actually do go back and look at that old data so I, I love going through like old stories, you know, just archives and saying, hey, this was a really great story five, 10, 15 years ago. Nobody's probably touched it since then. So it's very easy to go to the agency and say, I know you have this database because you previously released it um, and start from there. If, if you're looking for data, and then I'm gonna open up one last question from, from Ben over there, but if you're looking for data, another good source is the National Institute for Computer Assistive Reporting. 
which is part of investigative reporters and editors, but they've recently started, they collect data from uh, governmental bodies all over the, mostly national data sets, but a few state data sets, and then they clean it, process it, and make it available, and so they charge less for journalists, and they've just recently started selling it to the general public for a little bit higher <coughs> price to be able to cover their costs. So that's another thought. Go ahead, Ben. Uh, over the last maybe decade, uh, the, the words open data have been a watchword at I think city governments all across the United States as sort of uh, re you know, reform-minded politicians or self-cast reformers have said there's this twin benefit of opening up public data. One is it'll make it more transparent for people like you, and two is it will create all these awesome business opportunities to make products out of government data for people who aren't journalists in the room. How's it going? What, what grade would you give this process You know, a decade in? Is it making any difference? What's working, what isn't? What do you think? You, you are being ironic, right? <laughs> no, I don't think yeah. It <laughs> yeah, it's a softball. It's hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure the process exists. Yeah. Here, and, yeah go ahead. Uh, to follow up on, on what Mo said about this being a bad administration in terms of this stuff, uh, open data. All right, we just finished up a project about Cuba, uh, uh, people from Cuba doing Medicare fraud here. And basically we wanted the database of all fugitives uh, that are wanted by the United States Marshal Service. And the answer was, no, we can't give that to you for privacy reasons. And we were like, wait a minute, this is, these are people you're hunting and we're gonna help you hunt them. And they were like, well, fugitives have privacy rights too. And I'm not kidding, we have that in the email. Yeah. And to go to the local level for, for a second, um, when I was back at the Seattle Times, we did, a, there was a, we, we did a story about crime in downtown Seattle. Uh, there had been some incidents in the city, and so the police department um, was a bit under fire, and they came out with a, uh, kind of in a news release saying that, oh, no, really, crime is not, is, has not gone up in downtown Seattle, and they used... Um, as their parameters on the map, on the, the, the boundaries that they drew to show that, included a, a precinct that was really residential and old and white, and uh, so it skewed all of their, and that's because they didn't like redraw their boundary line to really analyze downtown Seattle. And we uh, collected their data every month in a snapshot, pulling it down from uh, this open government site. But we pulled it down as a snapshot and then stitched it together. That's just how we had our script set up. They also had an API. And uh, we went back and forth in the newsroom, in the newspaper. Uh, but they would say that we had the wrong data. We would say we had the right data, you know, in terms of how we were analyzing this spike in downtown Seattle crime. Well, it turned out that in one particular month, they had adjusted the crime numbers, but didn't tell anybody. And their API just streamed the corrected data out uh, that was actually n not accurate. And and, and we had the actual snapshot of what had happened that month because we collected it and saved it. But they, they changed their data on the fly so that if you were trying to get it through the API, you got this corrected data without any explanation of what had happened. Whereas if you had grabbed it snapshot by snapshot, you saw what really happened. And so we ended up, they finally admitted that in fact the crime was higher in downtown Seattle. And uh, it was this, you know, a series of stories that kind of got us to that point. But, you have to be really careful about the open data on the local government site because especially if they're just kind of streaming it out there, how do you know they haven't changed something in that data that, that, you know, if you're not tracking it really carefully? And so I think, I think there are lots of problems with, with local data and, and also in terms of just the, the format that they give it to you. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten PDFs. A lot of that. And not, it's not just PDFs, but a lot of the so-called open data that you encounter is heavily truncated data. Yeah, summary there's, data. Yeah, I mean, there's... It's not incident they, level data. They say, well, you know, we're putting our database out there. And then you're on the phone, well, where's this and where's that and where's this field and where's that field? <laughs> right. And they, it's almost like they're placating you and they're, there's this sort of uh, appearance of transparency. Here, here we're releasing our data, but it's not all the data. Yeah. Another trick they like to pull is like you say, that'll cost you $5,000 for us to go through that data. Uh, we know it's public, but we've got to check it for errors. And I'm like, you already posted it. You already use it for your analysis. We want what you posted, error or not. Yeah. The, the one, uh, going back to the PDF issue for just a quick second, and that is that 
I've had, I've had local agencies tell me that they had to give us the data in a PDF format because if they gave it to us in a spreadsheet, it, we could alter it. Yeah. Yeah. That's common. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. common. Yeah. Uh, why we would want to alter data if we're trying to report the truth, I don't know, but there you have it. So anyway, I think yeah. that uh, we're probably out of time, but uh, thank you very much, uh, panelists, for being here and talking about this. Yeah.